I'm Nick Zeppos, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Welcome to the Zeppos Report, a podcast where I talk with people shaping and helping us understand our world. My guest today is the best-selling author, Andrew Marinus. Andrew is a proud Vanderbilt alumnus. I should say, I'm proud that you're a Vanderbilt <laughs> alumnus. You graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in History in 1992. From there, Andrew built an extraordinarily successful career in public relations for over 20 years. As he was working full-time, he was also working on his book, Strong Inside, Perry Wallace and the Collision of Race and Sports in the South. This book has been the Commons reading for our first-year students in the last two years. It has garnered national attention. It has brought to the fore issues of race and sports and the collision, with many of those issues being current in today's news. Andrew has now found his way back to Vanderbilt as writer-in-residence at the Ingram Commons, and as we would expect of any great Vanderbilt liberal arts graduate, an innovator in residence at the Wondery. Uh, Andrew, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining me, and welcome to the Zeppos Report. Well, thank you for having me. It's a, it's an honor to be back on campus for this interview, and as you mentioned, uh, for so many other purposes right now. So, um, you know, it's going to clear up today, but if we look out the window, it's a little gray, but there's students walking across campus, and I am sure many of them have in mind what I'm going to do for my senior paper. <laughs> That's right. And so... Talk to us about your journey as a student coming to this story of Perry Wallace. It's changed my life, and it all started with a poster on the wall of a high school in Austin, Texas, uh, where, where I lived. I went to Austin High. There was this uh, poster advertising the Fred Russell Grantland Rice Sports Writing Scholarship. I was sports editor of a high school paper in Austin. I sent in a big pile of newspaper clips. Um, was really fortunate enough to win that scholarship, or I would have ended up at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, Great school, but yeah. it's a little cold up there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, and, and Fred Russell was one of the first people I met when I got here, wow. and so I felt connected to the history of Vanderbilt right away by meeting him, but really didn't know much about the school. My sophomore year, 1989, fall of 89, um, was the first time that Perry Wallace was ever invited back to Vanderbilt, to be honored, almost 20 years after he graduated. And so all of a sudden there was newspaper coverage of this person, this figure that I had never heard of before. And um, a, a student a year ahead of me named Dave Shinen, who's now a prominent columnist for the Washington Post, wrote an article about the first game that Perry Wallace and Godfrey Dillard ever played down in Starkville, Mississippi, at Mississippi State, and how they felt like they might be shot and killed just by playing in this basketball game. And they're holding hands in the locker room, at the, listening to the Vanderbilt freshman coach give instructions for the second half, and their minds are on survival. And so as a kid that was a history major and really interested in, in sports and also taking a black history course taught by Yolette Jones. Who's, My good friend, <laughs> you, Yolette. Yes, yes who's yeah. still here as a dean. Um, I asked her, can I write a paper about this person, Perry Wallace? And I thought that she was going to say no that this is Vanderbilt. You know, yeah. Sports is not a serious academic subject. You know, find something else. But thankfully, I think like a, you know, a great teacher professor does, she said, if that's what you're interested in, pursue your passion, you know. And so um, this is before the internet. You know, I showed up here at Vandy with a typewriter, not a laptop. Um, I, I found Perry in the phone book in Baltimore. I interviewed him for two hours from my dormitory, uh, the Towers, and scribbled in a little reporter's notebook and um, wrote a paper about him. Uh, the next year, I was taking another uh, similar African-American history course, and they said, you can build on something that you've uh, studied was, before. I'm to interrupt you, yeah, yeah. did you cold call Perry? Yes, I now, cold called. Do you remember the cold call, Andrew? Um, yeah, and Perry was just the way he always is. Yeah. He was gracious and patient. Yes, and thoughtful, smart, oh, gosh. patient, gracious, yeah, and, here's and a, uh, truth-telling. All of the above. And um, I remember sitting there on the floor of my dormitory, scribbling dorm? in a note. It was the Towers, yeah. Towers, Towers 3. Yeah. And um, just feeling like the world was opening up to me and that I was talking to the most impressive person that I'd ever talked to before. You know, so I was hooked from that very moment. 
uh, wrote another paper about him the next year. I was the sports editor of The Hustler. Mm -hmm. And the student rec center had just been built at the time. And yep. so I wrote some columns saying that this new building should be named, should be named I was, I after remember him. That. And I didn't understand, you know, building, you're probably going to have to donate a few million dollars to no, get a no, building no, named no, after No, 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 no. I think, uh, you know, Perry... Uh, Honoring him still is very much on my mind. Okay, okay. In an appropriate place. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. And th but that's where it all began with Perry um, and me. And I was 19 years old. Now I'm 47. You know, so for over half of my life, his story has been something that has really been on my mind. I've been so fortunate to have him as basically my professor for all those years. Yeah, and he's a, he's a great teacher. Mm -hmm. What, um, how did... Perry end up back in your life. It's one thing to say, I'm 19, I'm 20. Uh, Professor Jones is a great mentor letting you pursue your passion as an undergraduate at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. But then you go into kind of a very successful career in public relations. When does Perry enter the picture? Is he always in your mind? And then when does the project really start? Okay. Um, he remained on my mind for about five years after I graduated. My first job was here in the athletic department, and I was the PR person for the men's basketball team. And so I had occasion to talk to him for various uh, anniversary awards and, and things like that. And then, you know, I moved to Tampa. I was with the Tampa Bay Rays for a year. I came back to Nashville and, like you said, was uh, working with a PR firm in town. And I was still getting to do a lot of writing, which is my favorite thing to do. Right. But the longer I was there, the less actual... Uh, writing I was doing was more managing a business, you know, and so I felt like um, I wanted to do something as a creative outlet. Uh, my father uh, has written a number of books. My mom's actually written a book. And so writing a book was always something that was on my mind. And I was in my um, future in-law's kitchen <laughs> and declared that I want to write a book. And then got the question, well, what do you want to write about? <laughs> I, I couldn't answer that one, yeah. you know. Um, and then my father-in-law... Thankfully, he said, what about Perry Wallace? You're always talking about Perry Wallace. Wow. And I said, of course, that's it. I was too close to it yeah. to see, you know. And so um, immediately I emailed Perry and I said, do you remember me? I'm the kid that wrote this paper about you in 1989. I'd love to write a biography about you. And I know I don't need to ask your permission to write your a biography about you, but I really want to know that you're okay with this and that you'll spend the time to do the interviews and um, basically to have your blessing to do it. And he said, yes, I remember you did a good job. Go for it. And wow. that was in 2006. And that started uh, the next day after that, I got in touch with Coach Skinner, Perry's old Vanderbilt coach who was still living at the time, and I arranged an interview with him. And that began uh, four years of research. And then there was another four years of writing on top of that. So uh, first interview with Perry in 1989, the books comes out in 2014. <laughs> Uh, you know, you're, you've been on the campus, part of the Vanderbilt community for decades now, and your history of Perry is very much the history of Vanderbilt, very much the history of Nashville, coincides with um, our other distinguished alum, Jim Lawson. Yes. And then the Civil Rights and uh, Project Dialogue and America in Change. Um, how has Vanderbilt changed over your time and what remains the same about Vanderbilt? Well, you know, when I think about um, the whole reason that Perry Wallace was at Vanderbilt goes back to Reverend Lawson, as you mentioned. You know, when Perry was a 12-year-old kid living in North Nashville, it was 1960, and he would sneak downtown to watch the lunch counter sit-ins. And yeah. he said his parents would have killed him if they knew what he was up they to. They were afraid. Yeah, they were afraid for his safety. But he wanted to see what these students were doing, and he was inspired by them as a 12-year-old. And then, I mean, as the Vanderbilt community knows, um, probably one of the um, worst episodes in Vanderbilt history is Vanderbilt doesn't thank Reverend Lawson, its divinity school student, for leading these nonviolent protests. He's expelled That's from awesome. the university. And... Because of that, I got a chance to study Alexander Hurd, who's a chancellor um, that I really uh, admire. You know, I, I had a chance we to all do. yeah, I had a chance to meet him uh, as I was working on the book, and he was already at a point where he couldn't communicate. But his daughter uh, Cornelia, who's a professor yeah. at, at Blair, said that 
she could see in his eyes that he knew what I was talking about. And I was telling him how much I admired him and the changes that had happened here in the 1960s. So Chancellor Hurd brought in to open up the university. And um, he understood, for better or worse, the role that sports plays in American culture and how people pay attention to it. Maybe in outsized ways, you know, but they do pay attention. And so he called uh, Coach Skinner here at Kirkland Hall. I don't know, mm -hmm. was this the same office, the same room that Chancellor no, Hurd was his, in? Or? His office was actually over there <laughs> okay. in the provost space. But, oh, okay. uh, um, it's, all, it's all hallowed ground. With yes. Them. And he said, you know, Roy, um, we've integrated the undergraduate student body. You can recruit a black player. And in fact, I'd like you to. And so right across town, you had valedictorian at Pearl High School, three-time state champion basketball team. Perry was, uh, in some ways, the obvious choice for Vanderbilt to recruit. Um, and so the roots of that go back to the civil rights movement. And it was important for me to put Perry's story into that context. And now if you, uh, but it was a very difficult experience for Perry as we can talk about. But if you fast forward to the last two years, what I'm so proud of uh, Vanderbilt for, and you know, thank you to you and to the other uh, leadership on campus, you think about the um, enormous resources and how universities put their best foot forward for these high school seniors who are making decisions about where to come to college and the beautiful commons, you know, and the dining halls and everything else, the parents' office and all the work that goes into that. And then you're going to say to these parents and students, and you're on your first day or even in the summer before you get here, here's a very honest book about some challenges that this school has had that isn't a 100% flattering portrait of the university, but we think it's important story about our school. Um, I think that takes an incredibly strong, confident university to do that. I don't think every school would hand that book to their first year students before they've even taken their first class. And so in that regard, I think Vanderbilt's come an enormously long distance from expelling Reverend Lawson to now handing this book to its first year students. Yeah, there's there has to be, you know, kind of a, an accounting and a reconciliation. I talked to Jim Lawson on his 89th birthday the other day, and he's coming back to the campus this fall. And um, those streams really, really do come together. And, uh, you know, I, I think of Opportunity Vanderbilt and, you know, and then I, I go back to those pages of your book and the pictures of Chancellor Hurd and Perry signing his scholarship um, and think it was really a different kind of opportunity, mm -hmm. Vanderbilt. The opportunity was for Vanderbilt to be a leader in breaking this apartheid color line that mm -hmm. existed in sports. And um, I have tremendous admiration for Alexander Hurd and, um, you know, to put your life and your career and your job on the line. And, you know, it's one thing to say, well, we brought the chancellor in to change things. Mm -hmm. And then when you change things, people <laughs> usually the... say, well, I didn't mean that <laughs> right. or slow down. I think it in, it took um, you know kind of incredible courage um, on on all sides. Um, well, he had the his own board of trust president was his yeah. biggest opponent who also owned a newspaper. So I mean, yeah, no, no, it was kind of like uh, you know I I, I I I find it fascinating as the chancellor that you could have a board member who would just say, "Well, I'm going to leave the boardroom and they're going to blast <laughs> the chancellor," and I'd like to say. That never happens, but you know these are these are interesting jobs. Um, so, um, I think one of the most interesting things that I have noticed, and you've participated in some of these dialogues, and now you have these 18, 19 year old kids coming on campus reading the book, obviously not even born mm -hmm. when the story's told, and then you have the controversies in our country that really go back to decades before at Perry's time with protests right. of, of, of athletes, particularly in the Olympics. Um, what are the generational differences that you see, whether it's at a reunion event, <laughs> whether it's talking to freshmen, talking to your classmates, talking to a group of people who come together from maybe Perry's time to talk about their life and their accounting of the period? Right. 
Um, well, it's interesting. You can't take anything for granted, any of the, sort of the historical uh, markers. You know, I have a middle school version of the book now also, and, um, you know, those kids were born in the 2000s. <laughs> so um, any reference I make back to the Civil Rights Movement, I have to take a, a while to explain. But I think that, um, unfortunately, as you mentioned, in when any student, whether they're in fourth grade, and I've been to fourth grade classrooms, or a first year student at Vanderbilt, can recognize many of the challenges that Perry experienced um, either in their own lives or their friends' lives or when they turn on TV or open up Twitter. You know, um, I don't think there's any bigger topic in the country right now outside of uh, natural disasters and things but than sports and race. You know, um, and so this is something that's in everyone's face every day. Um, the thing that I'm trying to get across to students at any age group is um, what can they do? You know, um, one of the lessons of Strong and Silence, the first page of the book is just one page. You know, one chapter is, is a page of Bob Warren, Perry's old teammate, coming back 30 years later and expressing this level of regret that he had, hadn't done more to help at the time, you know, and that it had taken him decades to come to that realization that he should have been there for his friend and classmate. And when I was in uh, Memphis to speak at the National Civil Rights Museum several months ago, I went across the street and there's a nonprofit called Facing History in Ourselves that works on civil rights issues in classrooms. And a phrase that they use is uh, the difference, understanding the difference between bystanders and upstanders. And that there are an awful lot of bystanders and very few upstanders. And I think that when, when Perry talks about his experience, um, he says that we can all be treated by other people in any one of three ways. You can be treated well by others, you can be treated poorly by others, or you cannot be treated at all. And for him, the most difficult thing wasn't being treated poorly, it was not being treated at all. And this feeling of isolation and loneliness. And that was because he was surrounded by a lot of bystanders who felt that they were, um, they were okay or they were good. They weren't the ones calling Perry the N-word or threatening to hurt him after a basketball game or kicking him out of a church. They weren't doing anything. And that was exactly the problem. They weren't doing anything. They were these, um, they were the bystanders. They weren't the upstanders. And there were a, a few people that did reach out to Perry to treat him like a human being and invite him to his house for dinner and ask him how things were going. But those people were few and far between. And so what I think students today can relate to uh, in their lives, whether it's an issue about race or mental health or bullying or any other issue that students, um, teenagers are facing is that there's somebody in their dorm or in their class or on this campus that needs them to reach out to them the way that Perry did. And do they want to not realize that for 30 or 40 years, the way some of Perry's classmates and teammates did, or do they want to recognize that now and step up and do something for their, their community, you know, and that person across from them? Yeah, I think, uh, one of the most interesting things to me, and I've, you know, this is, I'm starting, I guess, my fourth decade at Vanderbilt, um, but we just had a 50th reunion class, class of 67, and, you know, there were people involved, you know, in the reunion who played with Perry mm -hmm. and are mentioned in your book. And, and I think the um, kind of historical account of those closest to Perry or even the students who watched it is fascinating to me. And the first page of your book, or I remember being at a discussion when Perry came back, we were in um, Surratt Cinema, mm -hmm. and a couple of students, contemporaries, stood up and apologized to Perry. There's been some very and, emotional yeah, moments. Yeah, and it was, it was interesting to me to kind of see the you know, uh, the kind of bystander <laughs> confession, mm -hmm. as it were, in the book, and that you have now, and it's kind of like, you know, history will give an accounting of justice. Right, right. I mean, and, and you know, and I really admire people, even if they were the bystanders, to step forward to teach these kids maybe today and say, you know, you can't look the other way mm, yeah. when there's just gross injustice and inequality and unfairness. 
I think that's very important. Yeah, it is important for the students to see those uh, other generations uh, say that. But, you know, and Perry is also such a um, forgiving person at heart also. And that's the, the book end to that story. That's the first page that comes back at the end of the right. book where he says, Bob Warren didn't need to worry about this. He was one of the good guys. And the people that actually should be asking forgiveness <coughs> will never even think to ask for it, you know. Um, and so he'll say, these my classmates, my teammates were just... 18, 19, 20 years old yeah. themselves. They weren't um, prepared uh, for this situation necessarily. And um, I think you can um, f you can forgive a student now who is thinking about their own experience. You know, it's tough to be a student in at Vanderbilt University. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great school. You've got a lot on your mind. Are you, do you, are you ready to um, step out and help other people? And yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Perry's, um, you know, there's a, there's a bit of the Lawson in him and a bit of um, the forgiveness in him. And I remember sitting with Jim Lawson, um, I was 15 years ago, and he had met Chancellor Branscom. Mm -hmm. And there was kind of a, you know, a, a meeting and a reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him about the meeting, and of course I, you know, I'd been here so long, and Chancellor Branscom lived to over 100. I, you know, actually got to meet, no Chancellor Branscom and Chancellor Heard. Um, and he said to me, I said, well, what was it like? He said, um, kind of, you know, there was a point at which he really, really apologized to me and said to me something to the effect, well, I hope you can get over whatever anger that's still there. And he said, I never was angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there's a, there's a, that's not to say there wasn't a fire burning in Perry. Right. I mean, I think his courage and his fortitude, and I think, um, and I, I think the your book and the story and the events on campus, telling the story of Godfrey and um, Perry together, is also, I think, really important because you have one who graduates and one who doesn't but who's gone on to a very, very successful career. Right. And I think in many ways made his own home at Vanderbilt and reconciled to here's the past and here's the present. I just uh, saw him recently. Mm -hmm. But the pairing of those two, was that interesting to you? Did you know much about Godfrey when you got yeah. into this? When I first got into it, I didn't know that much about Godfrey. I knew that Perry had one African-American teammate his freshman year. I didn't know much more beyond that. But I think it does make a really interesting, um, you know, two, two young men approaching a situation a little bit differently. How do they react to it? How are they perceived by the people around them here? And then what happens with their lives afterwards? And for me, one of the most special results of the book has been to see the way Godfrey's been embraced by Vanderbilt. Yeah. When he was on campus last year sitting at the uh, Black Cultural Center and student after student came up to shake his hand or hug yeah. him, he broke down crying, you yeah. know, and he said for the first time in his life, he felt like what he did here was worth it. And then that night at dinner before the Lawson lecture, he was the person that stood up and proposed a toast to you yeah. and to Vanderbilt University. And if you f went back, rewound the tape to 1968, you would never imagine in a million years that that would be Godfrey Diller doing step that. step back. You know, and he said uh, when he went to the Fine Arts Center and saw the uh, art exhibit right. and saw his picture on the wall, he said, I never thought my picture would be on the wall at Vanderbilt. And then, what, was it two weeks ago, he's dropping the anchor at the, at the, the football, football game. game. Yeah. That's really, really special. And um, the phrase that uh, Perry Wallace has about reconciliation, and he's got so many brilliant yeah. things that he said, but... It's that uh, reconciliation without the truth is just acting. Right. And that a lot of times people want to get to this reconciliation point without pausing or having a real honest discussion of, well, how did we get here? You know, and I think that both Perry and Godfrey feel that Vanderbilt has brought the truth to the equation, you know, and that at whatever reconciliation there is now is real. It's not just for show. Yeah, well, I think we have a, a, a lot more to do in that in that respect i think one of the most the pairing of the two of them on stage with you was uh really quite emotional for me and um i think the most powerful moment of truth telling and you know just kind of hitting me as a person and certainly 
as the chancers when Perry, when Godfrey looked at the audience and said, Vanderbilt broke me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It just it just destroyed me. And um, I think the 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 people in attendance, um, I think their reaction to it, but also their sense of how America and race and Vanderbilt had crushed a person of character, mm-hmm. intelligence, ability, and talent. And that to me was, um, you know, in many ways, the most powerful moment for me that, you know, in many ways, Perry was the survivor. And when you look at the history of the SEC, there are two football players who play in the fall in Kentucky. Right, right. And one of them dies, mm-hmm. and the other one does not graduate. Right. And then the basketball season is there, and then we have Perry and Godfrey, and then Perry graduates. Thanks. And I think that's an important part of the story, mm-hmm. that if you say, well, you're the first, well, how – how was the person treated? And particularly if we think of sports in a metaphor, did they make it to the finish line? Right. Um, I think people underestimate what it took to make it there. Um, Perry says it's a very fine line, even for himself, who did make it, that so close to not making it. You know, and he means that in almost every sense of the word. Um, the first, the next black basketball player in the SEC after Perry was Henry Harris at Auburn, who committed suicide a couple right. years after leaving Auburn. Um, and so it, people ask Perry a lot, would, are you glad you did it? Or would you do it all over again? Yeah. Would you do it all over again is the question. And he, he's answered that in different ways over the years. And I think that the true answer is no. And everyone wants him to say yes, you know, yeah. because you're so proud of him. But only he knows what it took out of this 18, 19 year old kid and how he almost didn't make it. But that's not to say that he's not now proud of what he did. And he sees the um, the ripple effect of what he did. And as a teacher himself, you know, he's a law professor at American University. I think he believes that it is worth it in the sense if other people can learn from it, if young people can learn from his experience or if it affects the institution, which, like you said earlier um, th- about this anger, there was a perception that Perry was angry when he gave an interview to the Tennessean after his last game. If you go back and read it or you talk to Perry about it, he wasn't angry. He was just telling the truth, you know? And I feel like uh, when I talk to kids now, I say the most courageous thing Perry Wallace ever did wasn't stepping on the basketball court in Starkville or Oxford. It was telling the truth when he knew people didn't want to hear it. And so there was this perception that he was angry, and that was what created this distance between him and Nashville or the university for almost 20 years. And then finally, I think he'll, he'll say this, you know, he was ready to be embraced by the school again. I think the university was ready again. And so when it's finally happened, starting in the late 80s, continuing to today, um, people have been able to to deal with each other on a real honest level without these misconceptions of anger. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you that, you know, in my time at Vanderbilt, um, his interview was still the topic of conversation, you know, in the 90s and the early part of this century when I was the provost. And, mm-hmm. you know, and kind of people saying, obviously I don't agree that, well, he, he was angry and he kind of, you know, trash Vanderbilt, and he was an ingrate, and we gave him a scholarship, and um, I, I remember hearing all that, and now, as I look back, and you know, I think uh, the true measure of the university, as Chancellor Hurt said, is not who we bring in, but what our graduates do, and what they do as alums. And here's an 18-year-old kid who changed the face of Vanderbilt, changed the face of America, put his own life on the line, and said at the end, you know, this is this was hard. I mean this was this was very difficult and uh, you know, it wasn't always fun and sometimes I was alone and it was just the truth and yeah. and you know, for us to I mean it might be painful to hear and I love Vanderbilt, but yet that's the story, and that's in many ways the story of 
America and racism. Exactly. Um, Perry said that it was part of the obligation of a pioneer to talk about your experience. Right. He said, what if Lewis and Clark had you know, gone out west and never told anybody what they encountered? You right. know? And so he said he felt he had a moral obligation to tell the truth about what his experience was like, even if that meant being run out of town. He anticipated that reaction. And how doubly unfair is that for, I guess, you know, the powers that be or the society around Perry to put him through everything he went through and then criticize him for telling the truth about yeah, it. As a, as a 20, 20 year old, 21 year old kid. And let me ask you this. Um, you know, we live in a time, obviously, as we read the paper today, you know, we see protests during the national anthem as, you know, I think Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now we're, we're kind of seeing these protests in, do you think in some way, Perry wouldn't put it this way probably, but his courage and his move to integrate sports was just one big protest? Oh. That, that, that it was kind of like, mm -hmm. I don't need to put my fist up. I'm not going to take a knee. I'm going to play in your game. Absolutely. And I'm going to rebound, and I'm going to dunk, and I'm going to score. Not that, And there's a little bit of that that comes through the book. Mm -hmm. where Perry says, well, you know, I had to learn to shoot because I was getting roughed up inside. How do you put, what do you think of the protests today? Mm -hmm. And then how do you put Perry's, you know, kind of four years of playing to integrate sports in the mm -hmm. South? How do you put that as a protest. Yes, no, I, I agree with you. And I say that sometimes when I speak is that his very existence on the basketball court was a bold form of protest. You know, people did not want him there. He thought he was going to get shot and killed just for playing in a basketball game. It was very brave of Perry. And I think sometimes he's underestimated because he's not uh, a screamer, <laughs> you know. Um, his protests were sometimes within the system you know, uh, and coming into the chancellor's office and talking about uh, yeah, experience for other black students right. on campus. You know, that was a brave thing to do right. also as a 19 year old, one of the few African-American men to on be campus. Asked to speak on behalf of with his all friend these Walter Murray yes. and others to come in and say, I'm a citizen of this community you, with these other students. And this is our list of concerns and questions. Yeah, that was very brave. Yeah. Um, and, the, and in retrospect, you see how it worked It worked out in some ways. The class that I took on black history was only there because of people like Perry and Godfrey pushing for it. But there was no guarantee at the time that their words would be heard. or that I mean, they thought in the state tournament, his high school team, that if Pearl did too well, they'd be kicked out before the championship mm -hmm. game. Those types of things were on the minds of these African-American students. But, you know, Perry wasn't always quiet. You know, he gave this interview to the Tennessean. Right. Um, he would come into the chancellor's office. I have the, and one of my favorite chapters in the, in the book was my favorite research moment was at the university archives, finding the verbatim transcript of his yeah. remarks, yeah. you know, where he talks about how the people around him in the room were turning him into a monster, Right. you know, because of the racism that he was having to yeah. deal with. And the uh, athletic director at the time said, well, if things are so bad, why don't you just leave? And at that moment, Vanderbilt could have totally trashed what it was on the, you know, the history that we now celebrate would have been gone yeah. because Perry could have easily said, fine, <laughs> you know, I'm tired of this. Why, why should I stay here? But it was Perry Wallace, this uh, 19, 20 year old kid that said, I'm not leaving. I belong here as much as anybody mm -hmm. else. You know, in the uh, he was told, well, we need law and order, not protest. And Perry's response was, sure, we need law and order, but we need justice, too, you know. And I think that's at the heart of the um, protests in the country that you see right now also, um, is I feel that the, the athletes are asking for justice, you know, um, and that that's being misconstrued as protesting America, really, when they're asking America to deliver on its promise, you know. Um, and it's just discouraging to see the um, very transparent uh, reaction to what's happening on the football field and some of the um, president's tweets or the um, the rhetoric that is coming from from that side and not really taking a, even a second to acknowledge what's really behind the protest. And you saw it in Perry's day. You see it now. The people who are being portrayed as the un-American ones are really the ones that are, are calling on the country to deliver on its promise. Very, very well said. Um, 
you're returning to sports with uh, your next book, and it's on the 1936 Olympics. Yes. And could you just kind of give us a short teaser on that? Sure. So um, one of the fun things with Strong Inside has been traveling around the country to talk about it. I've been to 17 states now. Uh, I was in Lawrence, Kansas to speak at the University of Kansas and saw a picture on the wall of James Naismith, the inventor of basketball, in Berlin at the 1936 Olympics. And I didn't realize that he got to see his invention become an Olympic sport. Um, and so that got my mind turning and... Um, I want to sort of develop a niche, if I, if I can, of writing nonfiction history, usually sports related for kids, the type of books that I would have liked to have read when I was a kid. And so my next book will be for middle schoolers on the first United States Olympic basketball team, which played at those 36 Olympics in Berlin. So um, as with Strong Inside, I'll have basketball as kind of the hook but as an as a, uh, excuse to get into talking about other things. So, you know, I've been reading about um, the rise of fascism and yep. concentration camp opening on the same day that the U.S. Olympic team set sail from New York to arrive at those Olympics and some interesting um, connections. Uh, and um, I've got, as opposed to eight years to write Strong Inside, I had a one-year contract this time. So <laughs> uh, I'm six months into that and I haven't started yeah. writing yet. I'm still on the research. So I'll be furiously writing pretty soon. Yeah. Well, we, we, we really, really look forward to your next book, Andrew. And, um, uh, the thing I, I try to remind our faculty, staff, students, and alumni, and, um, is, you know, we sit here to celebrate you, to acknowledge this remarkable, act of intellect and courage and fortitude by Perry, his family, who was, I mean, this is a young kid, and mm -hmm. they're worried he's going to get killed. Mm -hmm. And um, I think of Godfrey. I think of the courage of, of, of people going to Berlin to play and um, participating. I think it's an interesting thing how America can at the point in time where it's like, okay, we want to hear the story somewhat unvarnished. Mm -hmm. And then we put it in a book, we put it in a movie. Okay, but yet we should never forget that how much we love the book and we love the movie and it lifts us. There was a real struggle and a contingency to that history that Perry could have left. Perry yes. could have been forced out. People said to Perry, "You're lucky to have a scholarship." Um, right? You know, as if as if that meant he had to put up with everything. And so I think it's um, your story is important, and Perry's story and Godfrey's story is important because it inspires, but it teaches, but it creates memories. And so when people today say well, this isn't right, or we don't want to change this, or people will be unhappy about this. They think it's going to be easy to change things. And I think there's an interesting kind of divergence between, wow, isn't it great that we celebrated Perry? Well, he had pretty much a lot. I mean, there are <laughs> yeah, a lot of right. lonely times, and now we're all there. Mm -hmm. I think your question about bystanders is really important. Um, who's going to be there at that moment? Mm -hmm. I think that's and the, are you going to be counted to be there at that moment? And you can ch choose that level of going from bystander to upstander. Mm -hmm. You can choose that level, but you've got to make a choice. Right. And I think that's the um, what I like about writing about history is that it's not all about, let's put it in the past, but you see the echoes that are yeah. confronting you today, you know, and um, Exactly. There are a lot of people who would like to say, well, I would have I would have been there for him. OK, so what are you doing for people right now that that need you? And, um, you know, I, I was really happy to see the news this week about Vanderbilt's incoming class being the most diverse and most accomplished class in history. You know, and you think about when when Perry came along and when Godfrey came along and how how few in number. Uh, they and other African American classmates were, and how uh, there was a perception in the larger community that were that Vanderbilt was doing them a favor. You know, we're going to let them come to our school, and what a favor we're doing for them. Where now you see, 
diversity is making this university stronger. It's the most right. because we're opening up to more people isn't a favor for them. It's a favor for the school. No, it's our, it's it's the only way we'll move forward. And if you look at Vanderbilt in 1910, 20, 30, 40, 2010, it's always going to look different. And if it doesn't look different in the composition of the students <laughs> and what we study and what we learn and what we talk about, we won't survive as an institution. Mm -hmm. So, um, Andrew, this has been phenomenal. Thank you for taking the time to join me today and for your vital storytelling that has unearthed critical pieces of Vanderbilt's history. It's an honor to have you here at Vanderbilt. Continue with your great work on your books and thank you for your service in the Wondery. You are an, a classic innovator and a disruptor, as we'll say. You can download this and other Zeppos report episodes at vu.edu slash Zeppos dash report. That's vu.edu slash Zeppos dash report. Andrew, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This was a real honor. Mm -hmm.